But um, for those who don't know me, my name is Father Juan Luca. I'm from the Archdiocese of Vancouver. I've been ordained three years, and today I will be acting as the moderator for these three wonderful men who are here to speak on on a good topic, a a dangerous topic, a masculinity in the modern age. Um, I think they have. They have a message that the world needs to hear. As I was preparing for this talk, it comes from uh, a movement that we started in, in Vancouver. It's very, very small. It's only three months old. It's called the Cordi Jesu. It's um, of the heart of Jesus. To, so the goal is to be men of the sacred heart. And our goal is to plan talks like this every month. Uh, kind of like theology on tap, but really where, where men can come be nourished in the spiritual life and have some kind of community. Sadly, as is the case with everyone right now, COVID hit and all the plans kind of degenerated a little bit. Um, but we're able to have people even from the U.S. here with us. So that's great. Um, just to introduce the speakers who are here, we have Father Peter Nigren, OSB. Father, if you could wave mm -hmm. or say something. So I think they'll. Hello, I'm here. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, Father Peter is the, the rector of the high school seminary in Westminster Abbey in Mission, BC. And he's pretty much like my dad because I grew up in the seminary, in the monastery there since I was 12. And so when I was thinking of who could give this talk? Uh, really, there's, there's not many men that I look up to like I look up to Father Peter. And so I thought, you know, a good one to have. Next, we have uh, Jake. There, Jake, if you could say hello. Hello. Jake has been a huge part of my life in, with regards to my human formation in the seminary. And, and Jake is a father of three. And he... He has a, and they'll, they'll all speak about themselves in a little bit, but um, he has a beautiful ministry in uh, life restorations. Uh, and, and he has some podcasts that he'll talk about and you can advertise all you want here, Jake, because it's great stuff that you do. Cool. Thank you. And, and last, but certainly not least, uh, Father Mark McGuckin. Hello, greetings, everyone. Good to be with you. Uh, like a brother to me, he, we went to high school, uh, not high school seminary, but uh, the major seminary together. Uh, he's one year ahead of me and been ordained four years now. And he's recently just been made a pastor of St. Joseph's in Port Moody. And so he has the experience of, of, of very recent experience of being put in, in, in a position of, of authority and, and responsibility which is great. I really look forward to hearing from, from all of you. So if we could go kind of in that order, just introduce yourselves a little bit. Uh, okay, I'm um, Father Peter. I've been the rector of the high school seminary. It's my 25th year. And uh, I grew up in Gibsons, BC. Um, I'm the oldest guy here by quite a bit. And uh, uh, was, my dad was a fisherman, so I grew up fishing, logging, uh, worked in high regency for a year. I was cook. I was a, went to cooking school. Then I joined the seminary when I was about 26, and uh, joined the monastery when I was almost 28. And I've been here ever since. So that's um, I don't know how many years that is, but 35 years, something like that. Yeah. So yeah, I've been. It's it's been yeah quite. It's been a roller coaster. Jesus doesn't. Uh, <laughs> he uh, he yeah he he, he plays a good game. Uh, even better than the Canucks sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my name is Jake Kim. Um, I'm originally from the southern United States and am now, I married a Canadian, wonderful Canadian gal, and so now I'm a dual citizen. And I'm um, involved a lot with the men's ministry in the diocese. I do a men's retreat and other things. I also have the privilege of working and teaching at the seminary. So I'm involved in basically human formation at the seminary. So I was had the privilege of being two of the three priests, uh, one of their 
I was never Father Peter's uh, formator, but he and I would get to work together, which is a lot of fun and it's really great. Um, and then, yeah, like Father said, I, I do other things. I have counseling background, so I have a clinical, used to have a very large clinical practice, um, have a very, very small one right now. Um, and then I have two podcasts that I do. So one's called Way of the Heart, which is specifically for men, and another one's called Restore the Glory. And that one's more the angle of the integration of psychology and Christianity. So that's me. I'm glad to be here. Glad, Father, that you invited me. I'm glad to be with all you guys. So it's great. I scanned the participant list. A lot of familiar names. So good to see you guys. Hello, everyone. Father Mark McGuckin. Yeah, as Father Juan said, a pastor at St. Joseph's here in Port Moody. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here with you all and uh, with uh, uh, two men who have greatly influenced my life. Three men, Father Juan, as a, my, one of my closest brother priests, and, and Jay Kim and Father Peter, uh, two of my great mentors throughout my six years at the seminary. Uh, such a formative impact on me as a, as a man, as now a father. And um, so, yeah, before the seminary, I was working in the, in the film and TV industry in Vancouver and um, grew up in Maple Ridge, BC. St. Patrick's was my home parish and I was ordained in 2016, May of 2016. Spent two years in St. Paul's in Richmond, two years in St. Mary's in Chilliwack. And yeah, now I'm here in Port Moody. Awesome, Mark. Thanks. So we have an hour. So eight o'clock, really. So we might go a tiny bit over, but not not by much, because um, we sh it's good to keep to timelines. And so so we'll go right into it. Um, the way that, the way that this will work, I will act as a moderator. I have some questions prepared that will spring us into the topic, and then we'll see where the Holy Spirit takes us, and we'll we'll follow His lead. And so. Uh, masculinity in the modern age uh, to begin us off I think one of the one of the necessary things in order to be able to fight and to engage against an enemy and in order to engage as a as a, a warrior following a captain we need to know what assails us what attacks us and what what the plan of the enemy what what the plan of our captain is and so that's kind of the the Kind of the, the points that will follow a kind of the enemy and the captain uh, dynamic and so to begin with um with regards to the culture we'll begin with the culture um what would you any any three of you uh, what would you say is the main message of the culture towards the masculine in today's modern age Go ahead, Jake. You li I live in a monastery. I don't know anything about this stuff. You go ahead. <laughs> uh, Father, you have all kinds of good things to say. The, um, when I was thinking about this, uh, Father, uh, I feel like there's like there's two very prominent messages that come from the culture, which uh, really speak to uh, the, I think, the intention behind of what the enemy is trying to do is create confusion. And that's one of the main things he's trying to do in the culture of masculinity is confuse men about what it means to be a good, be a good man and what it means to be a man. And so on one hand, I feel like the message is um, you're the problem. Very, very simply put, you're the problem, men, you're the problem. And on the other hand, uh, you're not doing enough. And so there's these two almost opposing messages. Like if you would just get out of the way, life would be better. And at the same time, if you would do more, life would be better. And so I feel like the messages are completely contradictory, which to me speaks a bit to the bi diabolical nature of them. Mm -hmm. um, I think more specifically something that I've really felt that comes through from the culture. Um, and I have to say for me, I, I'm looking at, uh, I call it like whoever has the microphone. You know, right now in the culture, I think there's certain uh, groups that have the microphone which means they might not represent the entirety of the group, but they're the loudest right now. And so they're talking the loudest and saying the loudest things. And I feel like some a loud message that we're hearing, our, hearing right now is masculine strength is bad. Masculine strength is a problem. And if we didn't, if you guys weren't 
uh, if you didn't have masculine strength, then you wouldn't dominate and you wouldn't, we wouldn't have all these issues. And I think that's a, a really clear pointed message that when you take the veil off of it, it's actually the exact, uh, it's exactly the strength of a man that's needed in the culture. And that's exactly what's being assaulted. Um, so yeah, th that'd be some of my initial takes on it. How about you, Father Mark? Yeah, just to add with that, Jake, and to zero on that, that message that's so deadly and just blaring out there, I'm the problem. I mean, you're the problem, and I buy into that. Okay, I'm the problem. Masculinity um, is dangerous, that messaging. I think it's so prevalent. And uh, there's uh, just a, a blindness to virtue and the goodness of virtue. And uh, no distinction between what is, what is virtuous and good and what is, what is vicious. And kind of the vicious man equals masculinity. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, you know, equated now with just dominance, oppression, satiating carnal desires. Um, and to have, you know, good examples out there to, to break the mold and just to say, hey, there, there is such a thing as virtue and there's beautiful complementarity between men and women. And there is a real authority and strength to be heralded and to be taught and to be uh, to form young men in this. So just a few thoughts there. Yeah, I would tag in on that just to be a little bit controversial is that G.K. Chesterton was once asked, you know, what's wrong with the world? It was a, it was a, a newspaper sort of a column that was asking everyone to send in things. So he wrote two words, I am. It's true, I am, I am what's wrong with the world. You look at this group, we're a bunch of white men, right? <laughs> and except one, one's a little bit not white. And then part of it's because of his beard. And, uh, but I think it is important that we take responsibility as men. And we recognize, no, it is my fault. And, but so what? Okay, so what would you like me to do? As Jake said, like we, uh, you know, they're, they're damning us and then challenging us. And, or, or damning us for both, for not doing anything and for being who we are. And there's a lot of truth in that. And we want to run with that. But at the same time, we want to see, well, as Catholic men, we're not just talking about masculinity. We're talking about men. And for us, Jesus is the man. And, you know, the real crisis is, you know, we don't see, we, we, we're not living as other Christs and seeing other people as other Christs. And that's, you know, that's what, we're, that's what we should always, we have to keep going back to Jesus. He's the one that makes us men. And to the extent that we're not men, we're, we're running away from him and we're, we're parodies of what we should be. Back to you, Wancho. Thank you, Father. Um, just um, so everyone knows as well, there's a Q&A um, section in the bottom of the, the Zoom option there, um, which you can put in questions and, and hopefully at the end we can, we can try to uh, cover them. Um, but but as as we're going into this topic, uh, Father Marx, you started mentioning about you know the the complementarity of, of of the masculine and the feminine. Okay, so what what would you say um, is is kind of the the disordered relationship that like what is disordered masculinity in relationship with the feminine, and what would be ordered? Uh, relationship between the masculine and the feminine well ultimately coming down to not being afraid of, of who we are and who god designed us to be as men as a as a meant to be a gift of self and complementing the feminine and what i to answer this i do just want to just pick up on what father peter was saying in that closeness to jesus and that and that um walking that way of christ as as man of sacrifice and I'll share just a short story with you. It was, uh, I think, the fall of 2018. It was right after all the uh, news about the McCarrick garbage came out and the scandals in the church. I was in Chilliwack at the time, and um, Bishop Gary was out. He sometimes visits and a uh, great influence on me in, in terms of just relating to um, the indigenous peoples out there. And I was tagging along with him in his truck, him and his dog. And um, we had just had a good chat. and. Um, it was really disturbing me, this, this, all, the, the, this, all this next round of scandals coming out. And uh, I asked him, like, what, what he thought of it. 
And uh, he took a few moments. I think he took a good minute. It was just silence. And he said, uh, he said, Mark, if a priest is not walking that road to Calvary with Jesus, inevitably corruption, uh, drifting in the sin will happen. And uh, a failure to living up to the calling of a priest. Um, that was... Uh, for me, just so nourishing to heal it here and just simplify just in such a powerful way. Thinking about that, or just for a priest in general, yeah, but I think for all men, that having that closeness to our Lord and to really, really walking with Him and leaning in to sacrifice, to be a provider, to be a protector. Not to say women can't do that, but we have just that, that special calling to be providers and protectors. Uh, to be to make a gift of ourselves, um, and then to help women to be as good as they can be, as fathers, as husbands, as good sons of the Father. Thank you, Mark. Anybody else wanted to add to that? Jump in, Jake. You're the married guy here. I feel like you and I are on a WWE team here, Father Peter. You keep tagging me in, and I'm like, <laughs> "All right, let's go." Um, so, I, the disordered, uh, yeah, that's a big part of my story. Uh, is the, my disordered relationships with women, and I think there's varying levels to what disordered relationships with femininity, uh, how it looks and how it manifests. And I think to echo what Father Peter said. Um, the only reason that we could be accused of something and have it stick around or not sound crazy is if there's an element of truth to it. And so when we're accused by the culture of something, there's usually an element of truth to it. And that's why it sticks or that's why it hangs around. Uh, and the dilemma there is to know the difference between what's true and not true. So I know in my life, and I think uh, well, I've seen it and witnessed in other people's lives, it's not hard to see is that some of the disordered way that we relate to women as men is they're there for my personal satisfaction. They're there to make me feel good. They're there because um, I don't, I need something. They have something that looks like I would like it. So I'm going to get that however I can. Um, so gratification. Um, I think another one though, that I see that's, that was pretty common, I think, in any man who's relatively connected into the church culture knows that that's going on. But a different one that I see that's more common, I think, in marriages, and it's very, very disordered, is a man relating to a woman, I'm going to speak in marriage, as a boy to a mother. And I see that a lot, where men operate with their spouses as if they're re relating to a mom. And they act like they're teenagers and they, they have these weird distorted ways of interacting with their spouse. And essentially it's an identity problem. They don't know themselves as a man. They don't know themselves as a mature man. And so they kind of relate with this timidity or she's going to get me in trouble. Um, and those kind of interactions and dynamics. And it's not like your wife can't call you on. That's my wife is the greatest means to holiness that I have right now. She's the sacrament that I'm living. Um, but the, the problem with that is that if I start to placate and become like weak, that's not the goal. That's not the invitation is for me to relate to her as if she's my mom. And I can tell you for all the married men out there, you know, that's one of the least attractive things you can do to your spouse is treat her like a mother and act and treat her like she's your mom. That's just like that. Everything starts to go downhill pretty quick there. Um, but I think some other ones are common. Like one of the ones that I feel like is it, that's out there in the culture is men relating to women, like animal to animal, like it's, we're just going to treat each other animalistically. And I think that's very prominent in the pornographic industry and all the stuff that's going on in pornography. It's very much we're animals. And I think it picks up on what father Mark was saying earlier about the lack of virtue and that that there's just a, there's no virtue and so what do you resort back to your animalistic tendencies and i think that's a message too that we get as men you're just a you're just a smart chimpanzee who just wants to go around and um procreate but not really procreate 
because you'd like to contracept, but we just want to pleasure, you know. Um, uh, how about we'll pause there and then we can come back around to what ordered uh, masculine looks like. Father Peter, what, what comes up for you? Yeah, well, uh, you, you mentioned the tag team wrestle. We used to do that as kids all the time. It's, uh, in the grass, of course, we didn't, you know, but that was our yard. We had a big yard and a lot of the kids would come around and the boys we'd set up, we'd put like clothes around the edge, make our tag team wrestling and we'd drag the little kids. <laughs> so, I, so I like the image, um, Jake. And yeah, like one thing I always go back to is John Paul II before he was Pope is that a man wants to love in order to be loved, whereas a woman wants to be loved in order that she may love. We all, you know, both the man and the woman have an infinite need and an infinite capacity to be loved and to love. And it's not, it's not just active and passive in the sense that the woman is more passive, the man is more active, because the, the man has as much of a need to be loved as the woman does, is as a man. You know, and so, but at the same time, I like the, like John Paul II says, there's a, there's a refraction, that's the way I interpret it, is there's a refraction of the divine image in that, in the man's desire to, to love in order to be loved, that he refracts in a special way God as an agent, as a doer, as a planner, as a protector, as, as someone who sacrifices him li his life, as someone who gives a life that is not his own. And that's, I think, that's essential to being a man in the image of God, giving a life that is not his own. And whereas the woman, as a man, refracts the image of God as an agent, the woman refracts the image of God in a special way in her body, her mind, her emotions, her desires, as the end of all desire. The woman is a, the way I look, try to see the image metaphysically and the way I talk and stuff is that the woman is an icon of the lovability of God. And a man must, in order to see her properly, has to see that. And, and for her to see herself properly is to see herself as an icon of the lovability of God. Mm. You know, like as a man, we, we, we bear fruit outside of ourselves. That's why like the, it determines a lot of our whole nature, our personality, the way our bodies are built, the way our sexuality is so fragile and, and so episodic, you know, because we don't bear fruit inside of ourselves. We give a life when we're transmitting a life that is not our own. And that's, so that should determine my, the way I see myself in relationship to women is, uh, is, is as, as someone who's trying to sacrifice himself or to give of himself for another to give a life that is not his own, that is bigger than his own life. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Uh, there's a, a question that came in, which I think um, we can try to uh, do is here is as so if Jesus is the man and his bride is dissolution and suspicious and rejects him, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and the royal road is predominantly weeping and suffering, how do we find joy for the perseverance? When in the concrete, repeatedly fruitless, how to get that supernatural hope, how to take the risk again? follow our good desires. I'll, I'll jump in here because that's interesting. When I was praying earlier about what the Father wanted to be said here, the word that came to mind was hope, or what I felt like he said was hope. So I, I'll just acknowledge that. that. Um, I, I can speak to it as a married man. Um, there I think we have to accept the fact that the Lord doesn't ask us to carry a cross that's too heavy. And there's times where we accept crosses that aren't given by the Lord. And that's part of the enemy's ploy is to give us crosses that aren't the ones that the Lord desires. And so the first and foremost, I think has to be a discernment about is the particular thing that I'm supposed to suffer through actually something that the Lord is asking me to suffer. Is it his yoke that's been given to me? because I'm notorious as a man to try to find validation and identity through look at all the trophy crosses that I've carried and I'm gonna put them on my wall at the end of the day and, and all I'm doing is killing myself. So I think first there has to be a discernment of you know, the cross that I'm called to and supposed to carry. And I think uh, the second thing that comes to mind is I need, when I think about the, the scenes of the stations of the cross, to me, those are very, very helpful, and I have to translate those into real life. So 
one, I have to be okay that I'm going to fall, but the point is that I keep going. So falling is not a disqualification. So that's an important aspect for me of carrying the cross Two, I have to have people around me who are cheering me on, who can help encourage me and help me see the way. I have to be willing to let other people carry the cross for me when I can't, or it's too much. So deep comrades, very, very close comrades who will do the work with me. Um, and so I find that if I'm carrying the cross that the Lord has in mind for me, then I shift the meaning from, oh, this sucks. This is terrible. God, you're just this vindictive, tyrannical God who's whipping me saying, go get holy, go get holy. That's not God at all. And one of the things that I think is, is beautiful about it is that when I see the cross as something that's actually making me who I was always designed to be, that shifts the perspective and I can start to embrace it with joy. I love the idea of becoming who I was designed to be. I, I love the idea of being fully alive. That excites me. Um, and so I, what keeps coming to my mind, actually, if I'm honest, are the scenes from the Rocky movie. When I was a kid and I'm watching Rocky, the scenes all the time that I would watch before I'd go play a basketball game or I'd do whatever were the training scenes. They weren't necessarily the fight scenes. They were the weightlifting scenes or the crazy things that he would do in preparation. And there was something deeply inspiring because I wanted to be somebody who was strong and who could do it. And I think what's wild is that the cross is these, are, there are these opportunities for me to, uh, and I'll use the word loosely, but prove myself. I don't mean I'm trying to validate myself and find my own identity, but it's an opportunity for me to um, exert who I am and to actually show the world that I can do something about it. Um, so there's something about the Rocky scenes, and I think it's inherently masculine that it's inspiring. The other one that uh, the other movie scene that comes to mind with this is this, the movie Ma The Matrix. And at the very end, Neo, when he realizes the deception that's constantly coming at him, he almost effortlessly just puts his hand up and so all the bullets fall to the ground. And I think that's a call of what we're supposed to be. It's not about more effort. It's about believing in who we are and who the Father has made us to be. And then all of a sudden the cross is shift. And it's not about exertion and like grinding it out. It can become a very simple process. And the arrows and the flight of the enemy just falls. And then I love the scene. I have to be honest. I love the scene where he like leans over and Neil flexes and the walls bend around him. Because he, what shifted is that he came into his identity. And when he came into his identity, the world reacted because they thought, this guy's dangerous now, which was awesome. And then he goes and attacks evil. Um, so for me, I, it's, I let the fight is inspiring. But if it's the wrong fight, I'm toast. It's gotta, I got to make sure it's the Lord's fight that he's given me. Mm -hmm. Can I tag in on that? He's talking about movies, and I love Matrix, and I love Rocky, but, but I like the Marvel movies even better. Because all the characters, especially the male characters, they're all goofy, and they all have this weird joy about them. Despite the fact that they're messed, they know they're messed, and everybody knows they're messed up. You know, I, I was just looking at the question, you know, the Royal Road is, is predominantly weeping and suffering, and how do we find joy? Like, just like, hmm. Like, we have a, we have a tendency just to be a bunch of sucky babies. And, uh, and so oh, my poor self, I've got to endure all this stuff. Well, wake up. Look, where's, where's Jesus in the whole mix? Tolkien talks about how jo the joy is in the battle. That's exactly what Jake was just saying, is that the joy is in the fighting get, or, and getting prepared for the fight is a fight. And who you're fighting against? Your sucking self, right? The self that wants to whine, complain, blame the world. And, you know, this is, this is not, you know, we're made to have a joy all the time. And joy isn't just something that, you know, that is weird and nebulous. It's, Aristotle says the joy is a power meeting its object. It's a power meeting its object. So he says, like, when, you, when you're hungry, you got the power, and the more hungry you are, and the better the food, well, the better the pleasure is going to be, the better the joy is going to be. So how do we get joy in the battle against ourselves is we aim high, we aim with Jesus. We don't walk alone. You get someone to walk with you, someone to challenge you, some, some man or a woman who knows you well enough that it is not going not gonna to build on, on our self-pity. And we move. 
and we and we we get out of bed in the morning. We aim high. We clean our rooms, right? If you don't, you know, listen to Jordan Peterson. He'll get you. He'll give you some joy and some meaning, you know. And but Jesus gives you even more. Not just the psychological Jesus, but the real Jesus, right? We're made for Him. We're made to be connected with Jesus all the time, everywhere, with everyone. Then that's joy. If we're not connected with Jesus, then, then yeah, we don't have joy. The, remember the great saying from Leon Blois, that there's only one sadness, and that's not to be a saint. Right? There's only one sadness, and that's not to be a saint. You're on, Mark. This is a rich, this is great. Um, you know, just listening to you, Jake and Father Peter, I'm thinking, you know, another lie of the evil one is convincing, uh, well, all human beings, but men in particular, that what lies in the future is misery and dread and bleakness, darkness. And it's a lie that's from the pit of hell. And this theme is so good, this topic of moving ahead uh, adventurously, joyously, um, leaning into the adversity. And I think of... Um, the example of St. Paul. And I mean, here's a guy, we get a sense of his character through his letters, through the Acts of the Apostles. Here's a man who, hey, no doubt had a checkered past. Brilliant in his youth and a leader among Pharisees, persecutor of Christians, was complicit in the murder of St. Stephen. And, and we get that sense in St. Paul, even, you know, post-conversion. And we hear about his conversion three times in the New Testament. But he knows he could easily drift into sin. He has that sense of distrust of his own flesh. And there's that kind of a holy haunting of, you know, and a healthy regret of, yeah, this is what I did in the past. No doubt he repented. Who knows how many times. Yet at the same time, he is forward moving. Very few people were ever as forward moving as St. Paul. He founding Christian communities, fathering Christian communities, raising up figures like Timothy and Titus, who would be bishops in their own right. And there's this just leaning in, this embracing of the adventure and him inspiring others to do the same. And I think that's big to cut through the garbage, the lies of the evil one, to say, how can I dive into the deep end? That interior adventure of getting to know myself, God's love for me, that, that uh, mystical adventure of the heart. And then um, the exterior adventure. Okay, where can I physically go? Somewhere I haven't been. How can I, what, what relationships are kind of thorny around me? I could easily repel away. Well, why not lean in? Just building up that habit, leaning in to those areas that are, are difficult. And then what the darkness just kind of dissipates. We just keep moving forward. And there's a brightness and a joy and just a, just a life to be lived there. Father, can I, Father Wong, can I jump in a oh, little yeah, bit yeah. once more? Mm -hmm. um, I, this is something I'll share very personally that's going on in my life, and I think it connects, well, I hope it connects, maybe other men can resonate with it, is that I've been coming to a much deeper awareness recently in my life about how strongly emotions influence me to, to an extreme, uh, too much, I should say. And... Um, I would I always have said that I'm a fairly emotional guy. I'm a passionate guy. But as I'm doing some pretty purposeful reflection about the influence of emotions on my life, and obviously they're supposed to be the primary mover, there's, there's, a, it, there's a place for emotion. I'm not saying it's bad. But what I've noticed for me is that I've allowed emotion to become like my rudder. And that can be very dangerous. And so what I've noticed is that I've had, a, I found it hard recently in the COVID times um, to engage like I maybe did before. And I think it's a grace from the Lord, him showing me the difference between living a principled life, a life that's based on value versus a life that's based on how I feel. And I, it's been exposed and amplified because the day-to-day -day stuff in my life doesn't always feel good. And then I can get really down and then the emotions start to snowball, the negative emotions. So I think the nuance I want to make is that when I hear joy, I have to be very careful to not hear that as an emotion that I'm trying to uh, get. I'm trying to get a good feeling. Um, I'm having to do a big shift in my life right now of growing into living a life based on principle and value as opposed to 
it feeling good or not. And I would have said I did that fairly well before, but man, there's a lot of areas in my life that I was not aware of how deeply I was, I was just uh, putting the cart before the horse in a way or letting things get way out of hand with, oh, it doesn't feel good. Therefore, that's a good discernment tool. Okay, therefore, blah, blah, blah. But <laughs> it's hard because there's a lot that doesn't feel good. But the, the bigger problem is that I, I've let emotion become one of the most important things in my life instead of principle or value. And so I'm in this purifying process, it feels like right now. So I, I get the struggle with joy. And that's, for me, one of the areas that's helping me clarify it and address it. Thank you, Jake. Yeah, I love how, how in you know, just 30, 40 minutes of speaking about masculinity, we went right into joy. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think it's so, it's so central to our experience as, as, as men. We've all had the experience of camaraderie, of doing things and, and finding that joy in the battle. And I think it's something that we all long for. And so I, I, joyful at where this conversation is going and where it's gone. Um, there's there's uh, some, more, some more questions there, but I think they might be answered in, in some of what, what we had thought uh, previously here. Um, maybe we can touch on, on going back a little bit. What is true masculinity? Okay, well, um, what, what are its virtues? its powers, its beauty. And one of the questions it, it, it speaks of, of, you know, um, it says, I'll, I'll, I'll read it quickly here. It says, you know, we speak of men as protectors and providers as heads, heads of the household. Okay, but um, he says, I think this came out a lot clearer and easier in the more physical agricultural societies. Today, just due to modern technology and economic situations, a woman can and often does provide for the family more effectively than her husband. Does this husband have to be the economic provider to be the head of the household? If he cannot, for whatever reason, disability, job loss, work opportunities, credentials, how does he still act as Christ, provider and head of his family? Okay, so with regards to, to masculinity, this is, this is it in its essence. What, what is it? Um, what are its virtues, its powers, its beauty, its goal? Father Peter, go. Oh yeah, way to go here. I was actually, I was just, I, that's, that's, I was just typing a, a response. I just sent a, re, a response to the fellow. And yeah, like, I think, you know, we're, we're, I think it's a really good question in that we think of, okay, how do you be a provider? You know, when, the, you know, there's so many women now can make more money than their husbands. And so that, you know, so, um, uh, I was just telling this, telling him in my, my text message that, yeah, my youngest brother, he married a girl 17 years younger than him, right, just graduated from medical school. So he, my brother was, um, is, a, is a concrete finisher, very successful um, man. And, and so now, but he looks after the girls, he kite surfs with his buddies for 45 minutes every day. And, and but he has time to do all sorts of other things to help to work at the church. And, and there's all sorts of possibilities to see, you know, again, what kind of a man do I want to be? It's not just doing certain physical things. It's not just having properties. It's being another Christ. And if I'm, if I'm living in Jesus's presence, then the kind of man I will be, the kind of um, virtue that will manifest itself is the sensitivity of Christ. And it's the sensitivity of Christ, the masculine Christ, the, the Christ who, 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 who keeps pushing boundaries, who doesn't rest, who sheds his blood for other people. He's always on the watch. He's always protecting. He's always, he's always moving. He's not sleeping. He's keeping people awake around him, right? And then what's that going to look like in your life? Well, it depends on your personality. I had no idea. I, would, I don't know Jake well enough to think that he was an introvert, you know? And, and uh, we mentioned he was an introvert, uh, but I wouldn't know that. But when you get to know people, then things happen. When a husband and wife get to know each other, when they step closer and closer in their hearts to each other and to Jesus, well, then the possibilities are infinite. What's it going to look like? Well, it's going to look like you and your wife. It's going to look like you and your family. And it's not, there's not just a set mo model, but there's certain things that would have to be there, like courage, like self-sacrifice, like the joy of giving, breaking up fights, initiating good fights, and things like that that are necessary for a dad to be a good dad, right? But that'll look like you. 
you're right you know in in as in as as jesus manifests himself through you it's not a it's not just a, a thing that stepped out of the individual personality the individual background or or um or or character or or temperament I have a, a good friend of mine who I uh, used to work with in the film industry and uh, lives in Vancouver. He's a stay-at-home dad and not non-Catholic, but just good, solid, virtuous guy. His, his wife is head of pharmacy at Surrey Memorial Hospital, and he does odd film stuff still. Uh, but he's got uh, uh, three kids, two young girls, young, one, young, one young boy. And, and uh, he's, he's just awesome. He's just fit in to fatherhood so well. I mean, uh, it's inspiring just going to visit him because he's, he's all in just, uh, and the main attribute uh, is presence. He just, he can lavishly spend time with those kids. And then, and, but I mean, he kind of rules with an iron fist too. He's no wilting lily, that's for sure. Um, and it's, it's different than, I guess, the traditional sense of kind of the, you know, the working man, breadwinner type thing. Um, but he's still provider. He's still protector. It's still extremely masculine. And how that complements with his wife when she comes home, which is quite, quite different. That's a beautiful blending of uh, male and female. And then in the raising of the kids. Um, and uh, I can just see them. They're just benefiting with his presence at home. Just lavishly, just giving himself, just being present. Just playing, listening, uh, instructing, cracking the whip. Um, so I find those examples, um, we know them around the people who just live that virtuous fatherhood, uh, can, it can really, uh, be so educational. I think, um, for me, just uh, about the economic question, uh, in all honesty, I would say that probably Heather and I bring in about half of the income each. Um, and I'm totally okay with that. And, and something I think that's important for us as men is there's some objective realities and some subjective realities. And there are objective realities about our identity that can't be uh, replaced by personality or whatever. For example, spiritual head of the household. That's not a personality trait. That's a God-given uh, call. Um, I'm supposed to be the priest of my home. In my domestic church, I'm the priest. That's not a whether I like it or not, that's the mantle that's been given to me. With regard to income, that's different. That's, it, it's not an objective must that I have to provide the, all the financial income. There, that's not like a teaching of the church. It's not a dogma or anything. Um, and so I think it's awesome because one of the things that I love about it is that, I mean, it, it, well, I'll say one thing then go to another, is I want my wife to be blessed in what she does. I want my wife to have the opportunity to do what she is called by God to do. And it so happens that what my wife is called to do does generate income. And that's fantastic. Um, there are things that I do that generate income and that we don't worry about in the sense of who's bringing home the money um, because it's a mutual endeavor. We are providing supporting our family when it comes to financial matters. But then there's other things that, are like, I will never bear a child. That's just whether she likes it or not, that's her thing. I can't do that. I won't be able to do that. Um, you don't find a lot of guys trying to sign up for that one, do you? Um, but I, I think when it comes to virtues, honestly, I've been re going back to the cardinal virtues. Um, and this has been a new thing for me of just kind of going back to the basics. And so if you don't know what those are, prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. I would say if you're looking at true masculinity, those four are going to be there nice and solid. They're going to be nice and strong and a good man. You're going to see those four virtues there pretty, pretty substantively. It's not like they're not there in a woman, but they are there for a man. A good man operates in the cardinal virtues. Um, I would say one more that honestly, I didn't even, I, I didn't know how to articulate it, but it was one that my buddy, Bob, who does the Restore the Glory podcast with me, he, he was talking about the word that's used in Genesis for man. And it's a word called Zakar, Z-A-K-A-R. 
And I had no idea what it went. He and I went round and round trying to find the right word for it, but we finally landed on something that I think will work for both of us and it works for me. And it's faithful engager. Hmm. In other words, men are called to be faithfully engaging in the situation that's at hand, whatever is at hand to bring the presence of Christ and the kingdom of God. Now that, is, that, that might sound like, oh, I gotta bring the kingdom of God. No, it could just be that you wipe a tear or you wipe a butt, you know, whatever that might be if you're a dad, right? Both of those are bringing the kingdom of God, yeah. um, but you're engaging. I think that's inherently masculine that we engage in the situation. And so it's just like what Father Mark said, presence is engaging. We're not called as men to like stand on the sidelines and just be sitting over on the sides and kind of watching. I love Teddy Roosevelt's men in the arena quote we're all supposed to be in the arena. And that to me is an example of faithfully engaging. We're all supposed to show up. Now we're gonna show up in different ways, but men show up. That's what it means to be a man, you engage. Um, it's okay to fail, but you better better be out there in the arena with your brothers. Um, yeah. Thanks, Jake. Um, so, um, Moving, moving on here, when I was ordained a priest, my mom gave me a gift. I have it here with me. It's St. Peter's rooster. You can all see it there. <laughs> she said, I give you this to remind you that at any point you can betray Christ. <laughs> and the Satan, Satan is quick. Satan is, is, is sneaky. And, and, and he knows which, which strings to pull. And so with regards to um, recognizing that the masculine is different from the feminine, what, what are some of Satan's preferred weapons or, or tools uh, against, against the masculine, against uh, kind of the, those who want to, to imitate Christ in, in, as men? Hmm. I, to me, the, I can be pretty quick here and then the, the other guys can do their part. I think Genesis 3.10 is potentially the most brilliantly written psychological phrase ever. And that is, I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid. I think that one line captures the vast majority of what men experience in their hearts. Fear shame and disengaging and so when i think about what satan assaults i think he assaults those areas fear and shame and then the accusations when you don't get it right that make you want to hide and run away which you could argue as a version of shame but i don't want to get technical so i think a lot of guys don't realize how much fear drives their decisions me included fear is a major player in my life and i don't acknowledge it as much so I might notice the anger in my life, but don't realize that I'm actually angry because I'm afraid. I'm afraid of rejection or I'm afraid of losing my job or I'm afraid of um, my wife, whatever. And so then I react, but it's actually fear that's in there. And so I think fear is a major deal for men. And I think shame is another major player. So you screw up. Men, we're notorious as men when we make mistakes, like we crumble, at least I do. If I make a mistake, man, the enemy, he can knock me out at the knees and I can be out of it for a week. And I'm like moping and sad and whatever. And it's really rooted in pride. And because I was wanting my action to be the thing that validated me, but I find fear and shame to be the two biggest ones in my life. And I see it a lot in other men's lives as well. But Father Mark, what about you? I think, yeah, I mean, the evil one's tactic of planting seeds of uh, fear and doubt in the heart uh, and there's so many ways he goes away. He's a, the master. He's been at it since the dawn of time. And that's the subtle suggestions that are so easy to buy into and drifting us into comfort zones or any place of darkness. Those lies. I know we, we mentioned a, a bunch of them already, but, you know, statements like you don't have what it takes. God doesn't love you. Go ahead and indulge. God will forgive you anyway. It's all up to you. Trust only yourself. Uh, the, what the future awaits is dread, darkness. All of them statements from the pit of hell. 
and to to see it to be to be awakened and, and to counterattack, not be on the defensive, but to counterattack with the gospel truth um, is, I mean, just the only way forward. And what I find helpful is the image of pulling Jesus in down to it, into the work, into the into the rest, into the recreation, and into relationships. I would say especially walking with our Lord and. Um, you know, just coming because <laughs> Father Peter, you touched on uh, Jordan Peterson, and um, uh, not too long ago, I was listening to one of his the biblical lectures. Interesting stuff in there, and he had a, a breakdown of um, the Beatitudes, and uh, Jordan Peterson uh, talking about uh, uh, "Blessed are the meek; they shall inherit the earth." And he looked into that word "meek," and it wasn't an exhaustive exegesis on this statement, but what he had to say. I liked, I found resonating. He said, uh, meekness and for relation to manhood is someone, a man who has a sword, who knows how to use it, but prudently keeps it sheathed. And I think um, just a lot of what we spoke about hinging on, on, on that, um, a real power, a real authority, a real knowledge how to fight and a willingness to fight at going in with not kind of some domineering oppressive action, but to be ready and to know that as St. Peter teaches us in his, in his, in his letters, Hey, the roaring lion is ready to pounce, especially when we're down and weak and to be vigilant, to be alert and, and to cultivate that fighter's spirit. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, I'll tag in off that, both both of you guys. And um, I love that, you know, fear, shame, hiding. Uh, for me, fear, shame, and hiding all say one thing that the devil uses. And uh, I think it's one of the most um, powerful of the demonic forces. And uh, there's an old tradition that says that has the seven deadly sins uh, connected with demonic powers. And uh, the, uh, I think the most uh, deadly of the demonic seven deadly sins is sloth. You know, and sloth isn't laziness. It, may, it means being scattered, being so busy that you don't have any time to do anything important. It means being scattered all over the place. It means, yeah, living in fear and shame and hiding. And, and the demon of sloth specializes in all those sort of things. And it keeps us from engaging. It keeps us from committing and it keeps us from finishing anything. The word, the, the, you know, there's a tradition that links the seven words of the cross with the seven deadly sins. And the, the word of the cross that, that defeats the, the demon of sloth is, it is finished. You do something, you aim high, you finish it, and you move on. You don't look back, you keep moving. You get things done. You aim, you get things done. And you do it in Jesus' presence. And you do it with other men. You get people to hold you accountable. And you get things done. You know, and, but it, you, know, you look at each of those three things that Jake mentioned, fear, shame, and hiding. You know, what's the opposite of fear? Well, courage. What's the opposite of shame? Taking responsibility. Shame is just another, it's, it's an aspect of guilt. And guilt is just another word for responsibility. We take the guilt as Jesus took the guilt of the world on himself, right? Where, you know, Dostoevsky says that, the, so that everyone is responsible for everyone. And this, this friend of mine who speaks Russian, she said that actually the word in Russian is guilty. Everyone is guilty for everyone. Everyone is connected to everyone in such a way that they're made to be other Christs, to take on the guilt of other people. And that's what a man does. You know, and then the hiding. We're always hiding because we're afraid, right? And, you know, and the, and, but what's the opposite of hiding? It's taking refuge in God. So we rest in God instead of hiding from him. Instead of hiding from our failures, hiding from our weaknesses, we take refuge in God. That's why, if we're our, that's why the centrality of our prayer, our commitment to prayer, and, uh, and, and, being, and seeing ourselves, like for, for me, prayer is the most masculine thing that I can do, is to be an intercessor, as, as, a, as, a, as someone who prays and intercedes and tries to pray constantly to intercede for other people to, and give those prayers to Mary that she can use them for what she ever does. But, yeah, I think to, to sort of fight the demon of sloth with, with the word of the cross, with a, with a Christ on the cross, completing everything. 
Oh, that yeah, that was really inspiring. I, some of those connections you were making about the I've never heard that before. But what it reminded me of was a book that I learned about from you guys being around the the monks. And I just wanted to mention it to the guys. It's about sloth or acedia. I think's the other way to define it. It's called the noonday devil, acedia, the unnamed evil of our times. Um, it's by uh, Jean-Charles Knott. He's a Benedictine. So I, I read that book and absolutely loved it. And it was really, really good to address that and help me understand more of what sloth actually was. Because for me, it was the weird one that I couldn't, uh, you know, I could get pride, I could get, you know, but sloth, it just felt like a weird, lazy animal in a tree. But now I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. The, the main, uh, if I can tag in a bit, the main trait of sloth is you develop, they call it spiritual torpitude, a spiritual numbness, that you, you develop a sense of fear and dread towards the things of God. Hmm. You know, so you don't want to spend that time. You don't want to, so you stay busy. You stay distracted. Don't, anything except taking refuge in God. And that's, that's, from my point of view, that's the key, is, is that you take refuge in God the Father, who loves you, who encourages you, who holds you, who hides you, but also who continuously sends you forth as his son, as a warrior, as, you know, did any of you ever heard, Jordan Peterson told us he had a dream, but he went to heaven, you ever heard that before? He had a dream that he went to heaven, and he went to heaven, and he was put in this big Roman amphitheater, and he's had to fight Satan, this huge monster. And he said, uh, you know, and, after, and he won. And he went up to God afterwards and he said, why did you put me in this amphitheater to fight this monster? And the father said to him, because I knew you would win. Mm. I knew you would win. Mm. That's what our father does to us. And that's what a father does, right? He puts us in, he tests us, he makes us strong because he knows we can rise. Thank you, fathers and, and Jake. Um, there was, um, I wanted to touch on, on kind of prayer and, and, and touching on, on how you pray and how you've learned to pray. Um, I know, um, I mean, my, my mom taught me how to pray, okay? but, but it comes from, and I still, every day I say the morning prayer that she taught me, the night prayer that she taught me. And it really, it, it, it colors all of my prayer, even the way I say mass. I remember her teaching me all the, all the different uh, moments were to show reverence, what words to say during the elevation. I still, a lot of that, eh, but, but there's still, there's, there's different ways of, of prayer. Eh? Like, like nuns, for example, they, they view Christ as, as the bridegroom. It's a little bit hard for us, I think, to, to view Christ as the bridegroom. Um, except that unless we think of the soul, you know, um, and the church being part of the church. But, but how do you pray as, as men? Eh? How, how, how have you found what resonates to, to our Lord uh, Jesus as, as a brother, a captain, or, or how do you pray? I'll start. Okay, I just, uh, ahead, yeah, well, just a routine of spending time with our Lord before the Blessed Sacrament. Um, here at St. Joseph's, uh, for me, it would be just before morning Mass, just being in there early and, and spending time, do a little bit of the breviary. And uh, I find it helpful. And ever since my reawakening to the faith, this is back in 2009, of elevating uh, the expressions of the heart heavenward, um, just knowing that here's the Heavenly Father who, who's interested even though he's, uh, he knows all, he's omnipresent, he's, he, he's, he's aware of it all, he wants to hear from us. And anything that's on my heart, just to elevate it, uh, any little petitions there, and then throughout the day, um, you know, praying the bravery and uh, praying with others to start, I, I find just to, to start and to end meetings with, with prayer, just to settle people in. And then, I would say over the past few years, uh, just focusing on the Holy Mass, um, it, it, it's that the reality of Mass as prayer has really, um, light has been shone on that reality. Um, 
I think early in my priesthood, it was tempted just to kind of, okay, kind of go through the motions a bit. It's all structure. Just, okay, remember what to do here. And then it just, it becomes so second nature and it just, the focus just on Jesus. Um, that it's just a real more, for me personally, just a delight, a prayerful delight to enter into that sacrifice of the mass. I would say, um, sorry, were you done, Father? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would say for me, um, I find there's a lot of similarity. Well, there's one basic similarity between prayer and working out or exercise, and that's consistency is king. And I have been all over the place in my life of prayer. Like, I mean, I, I'm the guy who reads, loves to read books about prayer and then not actually pray. Um, so it's, it's weird. It's actually, it's, that's what it was inspiring me, Father Peter, what you're saying about sloth. Cause I was like, man, there's the, that's why I'm like, I'm going to go back and read the book again. But anyway, that aside, um, before like what I do, I have learned over, you know, pro, I don't know, a few decades of walking with the Lord show up. Don't worry about your technique show up. And if you just show up consistently stuff the, the the stuff of prayer happens because the father's generous and he he's not like well you didn't pray that thing just right so i'm holding out on you mm. that's mm. not his personality and i'm notorious for walking around prayer but not actually getting in the game and so that's an area for me i need to be in the arena and i just have to show up show up so consistency is king those are some precursors for me um one of, the, one of the things recently that I've returned to has been something called mental prayer. And um, it's, there's a guy, Dan Burke, who has spiritualdirection.com and other places. And I just appreciate what he does. It's faithful Catholic stuff. And it's one of his callings to just help people understand what's going on in the, their prayer life. And so for a while, I was really hard on myself because I thought I should be in contemplation and I kind of forced myself to be there. And I learned and my spiritual director was helping me see that's, that's usually not a recipe for a good thing when I'm trying to be there and the Lord didn't draw me there. And so uh, effort and working hard and contemplation, those don't really go well together. Um, and so I had to accept where I'm at. And so that was a key thing. Just be where you are and meet the Lord there because I had all these expectations of what it should be like. So mental prayer for me is I gave myself permission to um, engage with the Lord in a way that I could actually engage with him. And so my intellect, I like to think about God. And so I'm okay with thinking about something and then engaging in a conversation through this thought that I had, or, Oh, I read in the book on a CD, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now I'm going to actually engage with the Lord on that. And then what does the engage look like for me? Uh, it's several things. One is I like to journal. So I will write down what's going on, but I kind of make it like a letter like Jesus. And then I just start throwing stuff down there. And what that helps me do is keep attention because if I keep it up here, I can go all over the place. Um, the second thing other than journaling is I try very hard to be honest. I don't, uh, I've learned that I can play games in prayer and my heart stays back there and I put up a nice facade and then not a lot happens. And so it's, I've learned that the father's okay with me being right where I'm at. Uh, and I, it's okay for me to be honest, even if that means I'm upset at him or I'm bothered that, you know, he didn't do whatever, or, you know, and it's okay to come with that stuff. Um, and then the last thing is something I learned too that I do is called simple prayer. And it's just from this book I read, that was what the guy called it. And basically it was like, come to prayer and just tell the Lord what's going on in your life and what you're thinking about. That's it. Just come in, say, Lord, here's everything that's going on in my life. Here's what I'm thinking about. There's this and there's that, and there's this, and it might be a thousand different things. And then just try to end with a few moments of going, is there anything you'd like to say to me? And it might be silent. It might be whatever. And then that's it. I think the, the last thing is um, Father Peter is different than me. And 
he and I are okay with that. His prayer life is going to look different than mine, and it should. And that's okay. And I think we have this notion as men, like married men, I should, my prayer life should look just like Father Peter's. He's a monk, and they, they do it right. And their, their prayer lives are better. And that's just not a reality. Like, I'm not supposed to have the prayer life of a monk. I'm supposed to have the prayer life of a married man with three kids. And that will look different, but that's fine. Um, it's, not, it's not a competition. Um, yeah, those are thoughts. So, Father Peter, what about you? Yeah, um, yeah, I know exactly what you mean in terms of these uh, ideas of prayer, what it's supposed to be. I remember as a young seminarian reading John of the Cross, not really understanding, but thinking you do. You read all these, these cool spiritual classics and you read stuff on, yeah, you, you know, there are different stages of prayer. You've got the, men, you've got the higher stage and lower stage. Well, I don't, you know, I don't want the lower stages of prayer, man. I'm going to do the contemplation. And, and, but the thing is, there's certain kinds, in general, prayer sort of splits between two things. Well, traditionally, the way they describe it is active prayer and passive prayer. You know, contemplation is a passive state. And all the masters and John of the Cross, they say you can't put yourself in it. If God places you there, fine. If he doesn't, then you pray. You know, I spent about probably 20, 25 years just showing up, and it was good. Like, I showed up, I did my holy hours, and do all my stuff, the monkish stuff, you know. And, but I didn't, I, I didn't, I wasn't praying as well as God wanted me to. When Juancho came to the seminary, grade eight, 12-year-old kid, he was a little short, curly-haired hair, he didn't have a beard back then, you know, and, uh, and but he had, he had long, curly hair. And, uh, and, but he used to have this devotion that he, that he spread to the other kids and, and to myself. It was prayer, prayer, little prayer cards of praying for unborn children. And, uh, and so I, you know, going around every night, going around saying good night, walking through the dorms as the kids are going to sleep. And, and, uh, and there's Wancho, he's laying like sideways on his bed with his head hanging down like, like this. I said, what are you doing? He said, I haven't finished praying for all my babies yet. I don't want to fall asleep before I pray for them. You know, and, and, and he had the, you know, so he was, as the other kids were getting ready to bed, he's talking to me. He said, look, I, you know, you guys, this is a really cool prayer. Like we can save babies. You pray this prayer every day for nine months and you, and you save a baby. And, you know, and he came up to me. He said, you know, father, if every kid takes 15 prayers, 15 babies, and I take a few more, we can be saving a kid every day. You know, and, and then I remember this, you know, kid Francis, he might even be here, um, uh, Francis Tran, this crazy pianist, artist kid, but just most radical little brat you could get in grade eight, you know, and then and seeing him in bed, propped up with his teddy bear in one hand and a St. Joseph's prayer book in the other, you know, and then, you know, and then I remember when on both, not that many, only 10 years ago in grade eight, Immaculate Conception, Feast of Immaculate Conception, he's I knelt, knelt beside him at midday prayer and he's got a rosary wrapped around his head, his, his hand and he's praying away. And I said, well, what are you doing on? He said, well, it's Mary's feast day today. So I told her I pray 10 extra rosaries for her today. You know, I figured, well, this is the way prayer, kids pray is they just pray. And it's not just what kids do. It's what God is doing in them and through them. And they don't have all the messed up adult stuff to get in the way. They just pray. And so the kids taught me how to pray. And so I just, I like to pray the rosary. Like Jesus says, St. Paul says, like pray constantly. Mary said to the Fatima kids, like countless souls go to hell because no one prays for them. You know, like, and what are we doing? Like we're, we're watching TV, we're wasting, we're watching stupid, you know, uh, you know, podcasts and things like that, you know, but we, are we getting our prayers in? You know, like, like Padre Pio used to pray like 60 to 90 rosaries a day and sometimes even more. Like he just, like, they said, well, how do you do that? Well, they say he'd, he'd have his hand underneath his capucho as he, as he was talking to people. He's praying in the background all the time. And I, for me, like, I like to pray the rosary. It's something I find that very masculine. It's an intercessory prayer, but it's also a meditative prayer. And so I always tell the boys, like, if I'm not thinking of Jesus and Mary's sorrows and joys, then I'm thinking of my own. And that doesn't help me much. But if, I th but if I'm meeting my sorrows and joys and life and the events that God sends me in the light of Jesus and Mary's joys and sorrows, and I'm interceding and saying, always tell Mary to do the consecration to Mary all the time here. You know, just like, Mary, take all these prayers, do whatever you want. You know, and it's like the old ancient monks used to see prayer as like hurling javelins up to heaven. 
And what, what is God going to do with those things? Well, it depends on what they hit, I guess. You know, and, but just to pray. You know, so I, I try to aim for like 10 rosaries in a day. And I, I, so first thing in the morning, I try to get five in. So that might sound like just counting numbers. Well, no, it's going through mysteries. And it's giving a bunch of stuff to Mary to use. And I learned to pray that way from the kids. And I've been doing it for many years. And my prayer life has never been better than when I get a million rosaries in every day. You know, and so it's like, I highly recommend. You don't have to pray rosaries, but something that you just do. And it's there in the background. When I was hiking with the guys this year, when I, we, we bagged two peaks, these two hikes, and both in one, one day shots, we over 9,000 feet. And, and, I, you know, and, and I'm the old man, they're all mocking me. And so I'm behind everybody, but I'm just praying rosary on my fingers. You know, I got 19 rosaries in on one hike, you know, and just because <laughs> otherwise I'm looking up and I'm uh, behind. And, but just look ahead, step ahead, one at a time, pray the rosary, stay in Jesus' presence. Hey, I made it, you know, on my hands and knees, but I made it. <laughs> and what did Jesus do with those prayers? Man, I'll never know till I get to heaven. Well, if I get there, you know. Mm. But just pray. Set a time. Set some goals. And I don't always get 10 in a day, but, well, I'm pretty nasty if I don't get in five. You know, just try and just add it in, in between things. Get a decade in. Going from one place to another. Get in the car. Get your rosary out. Well, I, I'm not thinking of it. Well, that's okay. Just pray anyway. You'll find that God changes you just by praying. And it's his work, not ours. Thank you, Father. Um, I know we're, we're over time. Um, but something that I, I, I think is a great way to end and something that I invite everyone who's here listening to the talk to meditate in, in their own experience in life my question to you is what do you still look up to and appreciate and value in the male role models that have been in your life? What specific virtue, what specific quality, whether it's in a father, an uncle, a teacher, what, what sparked in you a great desire and a great joy? Uh, to imitate, and I think we can we can end with that. Maybe each one of you can can share briefly something about that, and then and then we can we can end with a prayer. Go ahead, Father Mark. Well, you know what comes to mind. Uh, I think of uh, you, Jake, and you, Father Peter, and then my own dad, and um, you know the three mammoth male influences in my life. And there's um, kind of the words that comes to mind as a holy fierceness and the, attract, the attractiveness of that. And um, I remember, uh, and this would be for another talk on another day, uh, for Father Peter, and <laughs> you and I know my journey toward the seminary and uh, those early conversations that we had. And um, I think it was the second one was back in 2010. And, uh, and it was... I, I was like, I encountered a, a force I had never seen in my life. And I was on the, on the, really on the verge of, of not entering the seminary for various reasons. Um, and after that encounter, I, what, what most impacted me is like, I want some of that. I want some of that holy fierceness. And, um, it just something uh, spoke to me in that. And um, I mean, the rest is, you know, kind of history to entering the seminary. But um, I, for all of you uh, here, Juan, Juan included, and I think my own dad, uh, how that holy fierceness is articulated in different ways of men who are just trying to grow closer to our Lord. And um, I find there's nothing more inspiring. Thank you, Mark. I can go next, Father Peter, you can wrap us up. Um, I would say there's several, but one that comes up for me is um, security in themselves uh, is something that I admire greatly, is a man who is, um, he's settled within himself, and you put him in various scenarios and situations, and he's very consistent. He, he, he's not trying to earn accolades. He's solid. And, and 
usually, well, for me, I can usually pick up on it pretty quick. A guy who's solid within himself and he's usually quite solid in the Lord. Uh, he's like a rock, and but he's not hurling himself at people. He's just solid. Um, and then I would say the second one, uh, I have like seven or eight here, but the second one I would say is humility. Um, I find humble people to be incredibly inspiring, um, very likely because I struggle with it. And um, uh, it's amazing to me when I'm in a situation where I know something about somebody and, you know, they're like the smartest person in the room kind of idea and everybody's talking about something and they genuinely want to hear what the other people have to say because they feel like they'll learn something, but they're a million times say smarter than everybody else around them. Uh, that is so inspiring to me because they're free of themselves. They're not thinking about how smart they are or whatever. It, that, to me, that's super inspiring. Um, few, just quick ones. Ruggedness is a big one. I really like um, steadfast, gentle, um, I said the same as Father Mark, fierce. Uh, yeah. Father Peter, how about you? Yeah, people that come to mind are, of course, my dad. I only had one arm, and uh, I, I can still remember one of my early memories uh, as a kid, uh, him swimming, uh, uh, swimming with me on his shoulders. Mm. And uh, I don't know how old I was then, but it, <laughs> old enough to remember, I can still even feel the greasiness of his back. And, uh, and as his arm would go down, of course, I would go up. And when his arm would come out of the water, I would go down into the water. And it was like riding this whale. And it just, yeah, my father, a very gentle man, very powerful and gentle man. And, and then Father Augustine, when I first met him, and I, uh, the first time I met him, he, 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 our eyes met and I could just feel my father present. Just this, again, this gentle, humble strength. And, and then probably the other three men uh, that have, you know, I most look up to are the last three popes, John Paul II for his courage and his theology of the body and his, yeah, his whole life. And then Pope Benedict, you know, and for his brilliance and his humility in his brilliance. And then, and, you know, and honestly, like, I love the, uh, John Paul and Benedict were like my heroes. And I knew nothing about Pope Francis when he came in, and but I've 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 never been so swept away by anyone's writings as by as by by those of Pope Francis. I don't know the media. So many people are are telling me all this stuff and asking me all these questions. I said I just read them. I read them almost every day, and I've never been inspired by anyone more than him. Hmm. And his the way he dances and holds a fine line, his his joy resonates in everything he writes. And, and, you know, when he talks about a revolution of tenderness, it's a revolution of, of courage and, and strength and the meekness that Father Mark was speaking about. But I, I can't recommend the writings of anyone more than Pope Francis. He's uh, just, whether it's his letters, his, um, his encyclicals, his catechesis, they're all absolutely brilliant and so pastorally enriching for, for an aging monk who's a, you know, I, I see myself, I try to see myself more as a father and a pastor now. And Pope Francis is just an absolute gold mine of, of continuous um, nourishment. Yeah. Thank you, Father St. Jake and, and all of you for joining us in, in this talk. By the court of years, we have one every month. Try to do it on the first Monday of the month uh, at 7 p.m., so 7 to 8. Uh, God willing, in October, we have um, the Feast of the Garden Angels. So we'll hopefully have something on, on the Garden Angels. And then it's November 1st, November 2nd, so all saints and all souls. So hopefully we can get something on, on that. And then it's December, Christmas, the Incarnation. We could get something, something good on that. But um, stay tuned, and, and thank you again to... To Jake, Father Peter, and Father Mark, um, I'm I'm so happy with where this talk went. I'm so happy at the just the mix of the of the group. It's it's wonderful, and and uh, I know this this message, God willing, will reach far and wide. Let's end with a, a glory be, glory be to the Father, Amen. to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Amen. as it was in the beginning, beginning as it shall, shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen.
Saint Joseph, pray for pray us. Pray for us. In the, name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a good night. All the seminarians in that list is a ton of old seminarians. So great seeing all those names. I wish I could see your faces. <laughs>